Um, everyone, we are here with Michael Lombardi. He is the star and producer of a new film called The Retaliators. That's coming out September 14th worldwide theatrically. And uh, yeah, so Michael, how are you, man? I'm great. Thanks for having me, man. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Absolutely. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the film? Yeah, sure. The film is, uh, it's a, it's, it's, it takes place in a small town, sort of in a Spielbergian, Dante-esque, gremlins kind of way. It's about a pastor who's beloved by his community. And uh, it leans in, it's a revenge thriller horror at the end of the day. Um, you know, it's, it's the, which is the oldest story in the book, right? It's like Shakespeare writing about love, but revenge, that primal instinct. And I think the movie sits on one major theme in this one provocative question what would you do if you had a minute alone with the person who killed your loved one uh, that to me is the core of the film but I think it's really interesting in this case the way the writers you know told it through the man of the cloth so it's about my character played uh, his name is John Bishop and what he has to go through in this film um, and in this story uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of layers and it's a, it's a crazy roller coaster ride yeah it's it's really interesting that they chose to make your character, a spiritual leader, uh, the, the brothers that wrote the film, um, and they face him, they, they, they put him up against an almost impossible decision, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, let's talk a little bit about that and what he ends up facing. Um, yeah. well, I think, you know, I think you can talk about, oh, I'd want revenge, and, you know, I, it's, it's no spoiler alert, like, you know, it's, it's the, the daughter gets killed and what do you do? You know, what is, and I think if you have a son or a daughter or a niece or a nephew, you, it helps you relate to that. I think you'd want revenge, right? You, they, they actually, the Gear Brothers wrote this story as a healing. It's the story is inspired by a, the, the, the origin of the story and the theme and that provocative question is inspired by true events. Uh -huh. So not the film itself, but something terrible happened to their little sister, and and they had to see their family deal with this and their dad and what happened and the, you know the the trying to get the guy and then the trials when they did and she was brutally attacked and and uh, they said to one another hey you know I mean uh, what if there was a service that we could get this guy and we could have a minute alone with him you know so so they came up with this concept so it's based in truth it's based in that feeling and they're wonderful guys you know it's like but the crazy thing is if you really had that opportunity could you stand there in front of another human being and actually hurt them you know uh, draw blood and, and do that um, so I think it's really interesting, especially, you know, it touches upon at the end of the look, it's a fun popcorn movie with a lot of twists and turns, but at the end of the day, it will ask a few questions of you, hopefully, and let you think a little bit about morality, religion, and justice. Uh -huh. And whether or not violence begets violence and whether or not, uh, how to respond to that, to that type of violence. So Absolutely. yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty deep, a pretty fun movie. Um, How'd you, how'd you get involved with this project? Yeah, so I used to uh, write songs back in the early 2000s. I had a band and a little record deal, and I was living in California at the time, and mostly on the East Coast, but I was out there. And my uh, music manager said to me, hey, you got to go write some songs. I used to represent these guys, Darren Gear and the Gear Brothers. They're amazing songwriters. They had a band. So I'd go, I'd drive about an hour and a half south, uh, and, and write with them. And creatively, we were just so aligned, you know, like our influences, our inspirations, our style, just the way we, t we wrote, we were like, so we remained very good friends. We wrote for a while together. Then a few years had passed. I hadn't spoken with them and I had to call them because I was doing one of the songs we wrote at a charity event and I called them and I was like, Hey, I have to drop this song a half step. I'm not sure how it's going to sound, but what do you think? You know, and but Darren, what have you been up to? Well, he said, Hey, my brother and I have been writing screenplays. And I said, send them to me. Uh -huh. And screenplays was the retaliators. And uh -huh. uh, just when I, I read it, I, it jumped off the page, you know, the wink at the eighties. I saw like, I saw like, I love like spaghetti string westerns and Clint Eastwood and Charlie Bronson and Death Wish. And I saw the Sin City aspect. I told you the Spielbergian small town beginning and, and, oh. uh, 
And then I told Darren all this when I read it. I called him immediately and I was like, this Tarantino ish third act in Evil Dead and all that. He's like, yes, exactly. <laughs> and I was like, and I'm like, I have to make this movie, Darren. And he's like, all right, man. And uh, I jumped on a plane, went out there. We had a dinner, we connected. And uh, I brought the movie to Alan Kovac, who's the founder and CEO of Better Noise Music. He's a legendary music manager back in the day, representing Meatloaf and the Bee Gees. He has over 40 huge bands now. Wow. And he loved the script. And he's like, I get what you're saying. And he said, Michael, go make the movie. I got your back. And uh, he gave me a list of his, uh, of his uh, musicians. You know, and he said, let's, I like this song. I like this guy. So I talked to them all before they got on set. Cause we placed some cameos in here, you know, but wow. our goal was to make it a movie first. Number one, Alan and I always said, let's make it a movie because it could come. I mean, you have, you know, people are going to throw Tommy Lee in their movie to get that audience. Right. But it's kind of like you spend money to get some star name, but we had them. So we wanted to carefully cast them all. I spoke with them all before they got to set about their parts and they're so good in the movie that hopefully if you weren't a fan of, you know, Papa Roach, you'd think Jacoby Shaddix was just an actor and then find out. So, so it was like bringing a, people of our genre who love the film, opening their eyes to the music. And then we have a built-in core audience so that they kind of go hand in hand. So that's right. what we ended up going for. Um, and, you know, just placing them in a very non-gratuitous manner and making it a movie first was the number one goal. Right, so the movie had to work first. And then the fact that you have these cool stars, that was just kind of like an Easter egg, you know? Yeah, so so really was, yeah. uh, you, you guys had a really interesting production. <laughs> um, can, can we talk a little bit about that and how the pandemic uh, affected it? Man, it was so hard, you know? It was, I, I know, look, I've been on a lot of sets as an actor, you know, and... Uh, I was able to pull, I was on a television show for a long time called Rescue Me. I did a hundred episodes of the show. Dennis Leary was the star of the show. He produced the show and he also co-created. I didn't realize at the time how much I was learning from the guy, you know, because, uh, because I had to you, you do a lot. You have to be a boss. You have to lay down the hammer. You have to make decisions. You have to lead a, a, a big crew. Yeah, I have to safety obviously always first we're fighting the pandemic you're fighting egos you're fighting hey I, I you know uh, uh, sometimes people can only see so far in front of them but you want to work from the back from the end game backward and see more like a helicopter i knew i i prepared i and again I, my way is not always the right way i'm never the smartest guy in the room i learn every day but there's a lot to navigate you know and um then you throw in the pandemic oh my god <laughs> you got shut down uh, you know, we followed all the protocols, but early on, oh, get this. I have two quick stories about it. We're yeah. filming in Connecticut in the woods and uh -huh. the Actors Guild sends a guy, this is in March of 2020, when it started to hit from SAG comes, a SAG rep. And he said to me, hey, he goes, you know, I just want you to know you're the second to last production in the world still filming. And there was another one in Arizona, he told me at the time. Well, I said to him, okay, well, look, you're going to stay in your own tent over there because we're in a bubble now. You know what I mean? We're yeah. like, we haven't been around people. We're in the woods in Connecticut. And then it started to get crazy. Like you couldn't get toilet paper. paper. Everyone's yeah. in Connecticut, but they're from Which Manhattan. And it's going, everyone's freaking out, right? The crew. And then I started to feel like the mad, like the perfect, like mad scientist that's, that's dragging these people through this pandemic and not being safe. So we did end up stopping a day or two early from what our schedule was and you know that so that was one instance then we go out to nevada and i was directing this bit we go out to nevada to shoot five finger and uh we 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 brought most of the crew because of the pandemic and by the way that covid tests were a fortune and we had to get the quick turnaround at that yeah time. you had to do the fast ones and oh man so we go out there and uh um, we, the location. So we had to get the locations guy. So we go out and scout with him for a little while. I have double masks, the whole thing. So we're there for five days. Now it's the first day of filming, right? I'm directing like this. I got everything five fingers coming in. It's a big day. And I get the 911 call that someone tested positive. And I'm like, uh. Oh my God. Now imagine I'm like, there's a lot of money here every day. Right. So, so, uh, 
it turns out we had the protocol where you don't get tested on set. You get tested before you come to set, right? Yeah. And guess who it was? The locations guy from Nevada was the positive, but he never made it to set. However, SAG shuts you down because they were rightfully so concerned at this yeah, time. Yeah. They didn't know if it was on set, how many people got it. No one luckily got it, but that was like a Wednesday. And they're so backed up that they can't get back to us until Monday to say, oh. hey, reinstated. So we're like, this is the kind of thing you're dealing with. And more, forget trying to just make the movie and get the creative, <laughs> all the fun little, you know. And, um, cra- you, you, you know, I just learned so much. It was, and, and the crazy thing is, you know, as an actor, you're looking upon what you could draw, like what you could draw upon for your character. And right. I didn't sleep much, man. I'd go back to the hotel and then be putting out fires as a producer and then taking an hour long shower to get the fake blood off and then th- thinking about what I might be directing for this segment for that day. So I was exhausted, but it worked for the character too, you know, so you use that. Yeah. And you talked about learning a lot, but it, is there uh is there maybe one bit of advice you would give other indie filmmakers that you took from this particular uh, production? Yeah. So when you read the script and you really like it, okay, you have to then iron it out, do table read, see what works, doesn't work. You could do it with your creative partners or whoever it is. You could bring actors in, but really know and believe in what you see and what you fall in love with in that on those pages because you're in for a hell of a journey to make the thing and you have to be filled with passion and love and it's like you can't do anything else you know you need to tell this story and you're going to bump into a lot of people and a lot of circumstances that aren't going to allow you to 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 bring that page to life whether it's a location change because of COVID or an actor couldn't show up because of COVID or someone else sees it differently or they don't get the rough cut whatever the heck it is But believing in whoever it is, if it's yourself with your partners, and I did that with the Gear Brothers and Randy Bricker, the editor on this, we, I felt really connected. My feet were on the ground every day. I was the guy out there, but I had, I had them on the phone and I knew like some of the things, some of the lines, some of what, some, some of the, the Easter eggs we put in there that we fought so hard for, as I said, against maybe a, a location change. So we still had to get the scene in, but we couldn't do it in the same way or someone didn't like it. We're like, we're still doing this. When I'm doing these interviews now, those are the very things that people are talking about. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, maybe we did this, you know, like the different genres mixed in one, all these crazy things. And the thing is at the end of the day, not everyone's, it's not for everyone, right? Uh-huh. The movie's not for everyone. Not everyone's going to like your movie. But to me, I don't want, I'm not trying to make a movie everybody likes. That's dull, right? So don't be afraid to make the movie you believe in. And hopefully it'll find its home, you know, and people will like it. And, and you know, in this one, maybe, you know, you, you go on this popcorn journey, but there's a few questions. Maybe it can go a few layers deep, but that's only from believing in your choices and standing by them. Yeah good advice and i mean like the worst sin a movie can commit in my opinion is being mediocre so yeah yeah because you're trying to play it safe right and you're scared you're in and it's the same thing with an actor too if i'm directing an actor who's in like a gray area i'd rather have someone going big that i have to pull back or at least know they're not good and be able to direct but when you play it safe there's nothing exciting about it you know there's nothing that stands out And you have to trust a lot, I guess. But look, for me, it probably took me a heck of a long time to get to this place, too. I've been doing this for a while, you know, and I wasn't always that guy. But I I try to learn and I make mistakes and you try not to make the same one the next time, too. Yeah. Well, excellent. And now you have a movie and through it all, it's out. It's coming out on September 14th, theatrically. And uh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I actually really enjoyed it. It was a it was a hell of a ride. It was a lot of fun. So. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate your words. And I'm so happy that it's in theaters because that's the other thing. It's not like a Marvel or a big movie. And I think it deserves to live in theaters for those few eyes that may see it or whoever may see it. It, it will, it's, it's a nice communal experience, you know, and, uh, or drive in or something like that. So it's pretty cool that we made it to some theaters, you know? Uh-huh. Well, congrats and best of luck on this release. 
and I look forward to talking to you again. Everyone, Michael Lombardi, The Retaliators, comes out September 14th. Go see it.